please raise your hand and Adrian and I can come around for activity times. And of course, everybody in here are now master students. They know it all from yesterday, right? How are you guys feeling today with this? Good. Well, I see heads nodding, so I'm going to take that. Yeah, we got it. Yeah, good, good. Okay, good. So uh, yesterday I used the analogy of, it's like a puzzle, these four puzzle pieces. And yesterday we really got the first two, and hopefully those clicked together for you, of looking at what's a, uh, sort of the pre-work and in Canvas, and then those instructional guides and how they lay out everything that you're going to be doing in the face-to-face. -face. And today we're really going to be spending these next sessions at looking at how those integrate and work together in tandem, really creating that blended experience. We really want to highlight and focus the that word blended, that these are not separate. And while students can come to class without having done the pre-work on occasion, they're going to be, uh, it's going to be a much richer class experience for them when they come in having completed the pre-work. So um, we're going to be looking in this session at spring quarter and looking at the two, two particular uh, modules, environmental issues and effective presentations. And today we want to make sure, again, that you're just really getting hands-on and in there looking at how the face-to-face -face and Canvas activities work together. <clears throat> Practice using the instructional guide, sort of thinking about how would I actually plan on doing this class. Again, getting a sense of what needs to be done beforehand and how you might approach the actual lesson plan that's provided for you. And then taking time to explore online and face-to-face -face activities for students. Kind of, again, like we started to yesterday, but sort of drawing those lines between, oh, okay, they're being introduced to this over here, and then they're coming into class, and here's how we're reinforcing that in the class. So again, we come to that scope and seek scope and sequence document, which we looked at several times yesterday, and as a reminder, in your program, you have four pages, which each show the unique quarters, topics, themes. Thank you very much. So page 47 for spring. That's the full scope and sequence that you'll see there. And can anybody remind me what the banding, why some are shaded and some are not banded together? They go together, exactly. So again, we are strongly recommending, because some of you may not choose to teach all of spring, for example, not maybe all eight, you'll be doing a tailored model. Please keep in mind, certainly at least in the beginning, keeping those banded items together uh, before you get a real sense of how that scaffolding is really in there and then also what you might need to backfill when you take something, if you took one of the pieces away. So we're going to ask you to take some time, and I'll come back to this slide in just a moment. Oh, thank you. But Similar to yesterday, we're just going to ask you to think about these two questions again. Where are the connections, thinking about the scaffolding between these? Why have we banded these together? And then also, what would be the significance of including these particular topics uh, in the curriculum? So I'll give you guys just a few minutes at your tables just to have that discussion and take a look at that scope and sequence just for these two modules. Okay. Okay, thank you so much. Would anybody like to share where you saw connections between the two? Yeah, absolutely. Wonderful, yeah, so that technology piece definitely does. So again, if for any reason you took apart these two, which are banded together, you would have to be aware of what had been removed from the half that you did, especially if you take out the first one, which lays often the foundational technology piece. Anything else that you saw? The writing, yeah, that writing piece, really scaffolding up. Absolutely. And then what are your thoughts on these two particular topics? Anybody have? Yeah, 
Great, so problem solving, collaboration, great. Why would we put something like effective presentations in? Not everybody loves doing presentations, right? That's always kind of a hard sell, but <laughs> um, college bound work, presentations, interviews. I mean, I realize this is not like doing a mock interview, but just becoming comfortable expressing yourself, your fluency, being in front of people. So um, this is a big, it's a big hit. People are a little worried, I think, when they first see the title of it, but um, it's, I loved this one. It was one of the most successful where students were just excited by the time they got to the end. So. Okay, great. Well, I'm going to turn it over to Adrian. We're going to kind of go deeper into environmental issues. Thank you. All right. Well, um, so, so today, as Shannon mentioned, uh, and as we mentioned yesterday, is really a lot about making sure that we're keeping in view this idea of the blended curriculum. Yesterday, we looked a lot at um, the online pieces, and then in a separate session on the face-to-face -face pieces. But today is about really pulling them together and seeing how they integrate. And so um, one of the things that we're going to do to begin is take a look at our first of the spring modules, which is environmental issues. I'd like to uh, take a little time before we get into an activity, um, an exploration activity, just to, oops, just to look at the instructional guide and to sort of locate and review a few of the key features of an instructional guide, just to remember what we learned yesterday. So I'm going to click on my instructional guide here. Actually, I won't. I'm going to navigate to it. We have some people who are new in the room today, so I want to make sure everyone is comfortable with getting there. I'm going to go back to my Canvas window. Down below those focus session three materials, I can see the two student modules. Here we have environmental issues and effective presentations. So ideally, I've closed all those modules from yesterday that I don't need um, because they're just in the way now. And I'm going to click on environmental issues to open it. If I want to find the instructional guide, can you guide me? What should I do next? Okay, I'll click on that Google Drive folder, remembering that this wouldn't be visible to students typically, right? It's visible to you as students because we have it published, but you wouldn't have it published for your students. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and click on that. And now what should I do? Okay, I'll just click to open the instructional guide. And here I have it. Um, so before we get into an activity for you to explore the instructional guide, I just want to review the significance of the sections of the instructional guide. So the first one is the module overview. Module overview is just sort of a summary of the module itself. Kind of a, serves as kind of a rationale, a little background piece. Why are we using this content theme and sort of a summary. Then the module outcomes, those are the objectives. College and career readiness standards are highlighted in every module. They're explicit, I'm sorry, explicitly called out in each instructional guide. And even without delving into the specific standards or the specific anchors, um, just at a glance, remember, we can, we can kind of see the relative balance of skills that are addressed in any particular module. Sometimes they'll be fairly evenly balanced. In this case, they are. Math is a, a little bit um, lighter in this one. But in some, You'll, you'll clearly notice a heavier focus on one skill or another. In the Math Basics module, you can guess. In the Writing Basics module, you can guess, even without looking. As we go down below that, we'll remember the, that critical piece, the module delivery notes, and we talked quite a bit about that yesterday, um, how useful and helpful those can be. Down below the module delivery notes, we have the module at a glance, that um, shaded grid where we can see these green and white pairs of um, subtopics. So we see environmental issues, the uh, environmental issues for the pre-class and environmental issues for the in-class work, that those go together and support each other. And then as we scroll down, we can see the second subtopic, garbage and recycling, green and white. 
The third subtopic, water, green and white, followed by energy and the future. And then below that, typically starting around page five in an instructional guide, we'll see the day-by-day, step-by-step instructions. In the first subtopic, we can see the pre-class introduction part. That's just a quick reminder of what students did in Canvas. If there was a learn activity, we'll see the vocabulary items highlighted there so that you don't have to go back into the learn itself. You don't have to click, um, you know, open Canvas to check what the vocabulary were. This would be one place that you can see it. And then we'll see the in-class portion for that day's lesson. All right. Good. So I'm going to just scroll back up to the top here. And we'll come back to that instructional guide in just a minute. So for each module, for each subtopic, we can always, you know, take a look. Usually in that module at a glance, in that green and white grid, we always have that sort of snapshot view of what's going on in the e-learning or the pre-work and what's going on in face-to-face. -face. Here they're side by side. In that grid, they're top and bottom. But it's a way to see, again, just at a glance, um, which activities are going to be related together. This can be useful. Um, just to give me a quick idea, a quick reminder of what's going to happen in which chunks, but also as Shannon mentioned yesterday, um, if you're teaching on a different type of schedule, say a three-day schedule, a four-day schedule, something like that, it can really help you to take a look at which pieces from the e-learning are preparing students for which pieces in the face-to-face, -face, so that if I have to change where I draw my lines, again, if I have to change how I'm separating my um, activities out into different days of the week. If I'm going to do this creating pie charts and bar graphs, I want to make sure that I've had students do the charts and graph activity in Canvas. And if I haven't done that yet, they're not going to be ready for this. I might want to do some reordering, for example. Just for those of you who might be working on a different schedule, this just came to mind. Um, although I sometimes had to merge two activities together during the face-to-face, -face, or maybe I had to not do one of the warm-ups in lieu of another sort of thing, I never, I never missed any of the Canvas work. The students did all of the Canvas work for the modules that they were assigned because it is there is so much wonderful information there and they can go back and review it and they can keep taking those quizzes. So even if in class I wasn't able to necessarily do the exact activity that matched that, I didn't want them to miss the opportunity to learn that and have that information. So I guess I just wanted to mention that. I, you know, I had to do a lot of fiddling with you know, where I was starting and ending things in the face-to-face, -face, but I really retained everything that was in Canvas. So I just wanted to mention that. No, that's perfect. I'm so glad that you did mention it. Um, and another thing, if you find yourself in that position where there, are cer there may be certain face-to-face -face activities that you need to blend together or some that you just need to, to take out, it's really fine for you to, even in Canvas, mark certain activities as optional, for example. There will be some things that are already marked as optional. Not a lot. I think over time we did away with most of that, but you have the opportunity to go th in and mark anything as optional so that if you know you're not going to get to it, but you also know that you have many students who would be interested, go ahead, leave it available to them. Um, and if you don't have time to follow up in class, at least they were able to access that content. Um, it is worth noting, it is worth noting that in Canvas, if there's an activity that is a submission task, I mean, if there's a quiz, even if it's a practice quiz, but it's housed in the form of a quiz, or um, a do, where they're going to submit either um, a document or submit maybe a link to a Google Doc. If there's something like that that's a submission, once a student has submitted, 
any student has submitted, you can no longer unpublish that activity, um, which you can imagine how delighted Shannon was when she found out that her student had done all of those end of quarter. There was nothing that she could unpublish, and we've all <laughs> fallen into that trap. So if there's something that you want to designate, maybe there's a, a an input activity and then a practice that's a quiz and you want to make it optional. There's, you know, there's little tricks that you can do, but once once a student has submitted it, you, you can no longer unpublish it. So if you want it to be optional, mark it as optional. You can always go through and maybe change the quiz to be marked as a practice quiz so that there won't be points attached. That's certainly an option that you have. Um, but just, you know, just keep it in mind. You, you have a lot of flexibility to manipulate things. And so use that to your advantage and to your student's advantage. All right, so your turn, woohoo. We're going to go ahead and get into that environmental issues instructional guide, but not only the instructional guide. Again, today we really wanna focus with each and every module that we touch on the, the blended fashion of how we will deliver that. And so I'm going to ask you to take, take a minute to you know, use your tabbed browsing skills and maybe also if you have a printed copy of your program book, there's a worksheet, a handout that we're gonna work through in there. That one is a conference handout, not a student handout. You'll find that handout on pages 25 and 26 in your conference book or in your PDF if you're um, working from a screen version. The scenario here is that tomorrow you'll be teaching the garbage and recycling section of the environmental issues module. I'm going to ask from the information that you have available to you on your screen, whatever you're looking at, can you tell me which day or which number subtopic the garbage and recycling section is? You could find this information either in Canvas or in the instructional guide. There are a few different places you could look. And there's no prize, but I could give you a shot glass of trail mix. Okay. <laughs> okay, which? Two. Okay, so it's the second. This will be the second subtopic. So there will be a little scrolling, but not too far. All right. Um, so I, I would like for you to imagine that you're going to teach this section. This is the day. And so I guess that would make tomorrow a Tuesday. But oh, heavens, we're not ready for it to be a Tuesday. So let's really have Saturday tomorrow. But pretend that it'll be a Tuesday and you're going to teach garbage and recycling section. And so the task is for you to preview both the online and face-to-face -face activities with a partner, with a small group, or independently if you prefer, and then to mentally prepare your lesson and complete this environmental issues activity handout. That handout, again, is a workshop handout, not a student handout, and it's one that you'll find on page 25 and 26 in your conference book. That handout will just serve to kind of help you walk through and explore these two pieces of the um, the resources for this module, both the Canvas portion and the face-to-face -face portion through your instructional guide. I'm gonna click out and find my resources. I can be looking at Canvas in the Environmental Issues module. I'm gonna scroll down past the first subtopic of Environmental Issues and find the Garbage and Recycling subtopic. So I'll have that available to myself. And then on a different tab, I've got my environmental issues instructional guide open. And I can scroll down to find the information about the garbage and recycling subtopic. Remember that I can either scroll for it or I can click on the view and show the document outline and then scroll on the side to find my module at a glance or get down further into the instructional guide and find the garbage and recycling. So I've got a lot of places that I can look um, to find this information and I'm gonna stop talking now and let you have at it. Yeah, yeah um, directors or anyone else who just feels a little unsure if this is feeling like a newer task and you're not quite sure how to find what you need, just holler.
Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm going to interrupt just for a moment. We're not quite ready to wrap up our time on this activity just yet, but I am going to interrupt, interject for a moment, um, because I know that a lot of you are getting into that learn activity and getting stuck on that recording snag that we talked about yesterday. Not everyone, but many. So I want to talk about troubleshooting that, and I also want to show you what it should look like when it's working. Okay? All right, so we'll just take a minute for that, but I don't want to completely halt, but here I am interrupting anyway. All right, so one of the things I mentioned to you yesterday was that sometimes, depending on the combination of your equipment and your connectivity to the internet and your flash settings and whatever, sometimes it works great, sometimes it doesn't work. Um, if you can't make it work, one thing that we've uh, talked about with some of you is the idea of having students, for example, where it says read and speak. Let me make this a little bit bigger. Where it says read and speak, you could always have students just kind of as a placeholder, click there and type the words. It's not practicing the same skill, but it's practicing a skill, so that's better. So that might be one suggestion that you could make to students if they get stuck. Some of us also have had students record elsewhere, you know, record in their cell phone and upload it. Because what happens is when you click on this thing to record or upload, they could upload. Um, so you could, if you can't make recording work in your Canvas instance, in the way that your world is working, um, if that just never comes together, this might be another option that you could pursue. Um, if it does work though, I would like to show you what it looks like so that You'd know. Can is this big enough for you to see ish? That box is there. You'll see a little. I, to be clear, I am making sure that even though I'm in this activity, I'm, I'm in this question. I like to coach students to scroll so that their words appear near the top of the screen, and you'll see why in a minute. I'm going to click on that little box that looks like a play bar. Record, upload media. Okay, so this is why, because you get, it grays out the screen, but I can still see the words up top. Um, so having them up there can be helpful. I can also move my recording box, but still, it's nice to have those up out of the way. When this box pops open, it will pop open uh, by default to a webcam. And I don't need a video recording of myself in there right now. Um, but I can also click on just the mic only below. And mine happens to be giving me this, oh, do you want flash, you know, to, do you want to allow or deny that? I want to allow it, so I will say so. And so what I'll get is a little recording box like this. I, it's easy to function, I, or easy to operate. I can just click anywhere to start recording. Recycle. Contaminated. Reduce. Sustainable. Compost. I'll click again to stop. Did you? Oh, okay, I'll try again. Do I want, it, whether it worked or not, it will always ask the student, do you want to record again? Okay, I do, yes. Recycle. Contaminated, reduce, sustainable, compost. So typically what will happen here, you know, we've got, we've got extra things plugged in because we're doing the videoing, so I'm not necessarily hearing this play out of my speaker, but typically it's going to just, as soon as I finish and I stop, it'll play it back to me. So the student can hear and they can decide right now, yes, I like it, save, or no, I don't like it, record again. Right? They can go until they're happy and then they'll just click to save and it'll be done. So it saves my recording, it shows up there, they don't need to do another thing, just continue on, do the rest of their learn activity, and remember to submit at the bottom, okay? So I'm gonna, yeah, please. So after you become more familiar with the program and what they need to do, and you start hearing some of the barriers that students are experiencing at home with technology, you're able to predict 
what you might need to pre-teach them. Things like you have to say allow to let Flash play. You might need to do it a second time. You might need to teach them how to move, drag and drop that box because it's covering the words. Or as Adria showed you, if you push that little red button again, it's going to say, do you want to re-record? So I recorded, I click stop, I have my two options. If you click the red button, it's saying you want to do it again. So they'll say yes, because they think they're saving. I recorded. I see the word record. record. And then I'll say, oh, I think you missed question one. Do you want to go back and do it? No, teacher, I recorded it. I recorded it. Now I know I really need to have them say save. And then they have to see this other little box with the arrow show up in your answer box or else I can't hear it. So you start to be able to predict these things. But in the beginning, there is such a learning curve with the technology that I know a lot of us had different ways that we told, I guess different guidelines on how long we expected or hoped they would try and troubleshoot at home. And mine was 20 minutes. If, you're, if you try for 20 minutes, you can't do it. Is, is it you that say cup of coffee? Somebody else, yeah, if you can drink a cup of coffee and can't make it work, please move on. I, at the very beginning, had people come in very frustrated and say, I, you know, I spent an hour trying to do this. I, was, I am so sorry. Please don't. You know, and that just kind of made this mental note for me to say at the beginning. So that was my guideline. But um, so I encourage you to sort of think how you might want to do that. But message that like on day one so that they, they know they're not going to be penalized for coming to class and not having finished something. So thank you. Sorry. It's also just another plug for making sure that they know who their other resources could be. And they may be at home and not have access to another resource, but they may be on campus and be able to walk to e-learning and get some help right now, or walk to IT and get some help right now, or call IT or call e-learning. So, you know, they may have access to a resource that isn't you. Okay, so, so, but sometimes we have to just cut our losses. All right, um, so we'd like to give you a few more minutes to continue working through this activity. I scrolled down on my handout to the face-to-face -face portion in case you're there, but I'm just trying to be able to show some of that worksheet um, on the screen at any given time. So please continue to explore this module. I'm sorry, not the module, but the specific garbage and recycling subsection, those canvas and face-to-face -face activities to get a sense of how that blend works, and then we'll come back together in maybe five more minutes. Are you ready for my favorite joke now? I told you yesterday that I had a favorite joke that I sometimes like to tell to pull groups back together, but I was hesitant. But I don't feel hesitant anymore, so I'm going to do it. Are you ready? All right. Oh, you're so ready. Okay. It feels really official now because you're quiet. Okay. Knock, knock. Interrupting cow. Moo. It's so ridiculous. It's such a ridiculous joke, but I do not get enough of it. All right. 
you've been subject, subjected to that. So moo, that's what I feel like each time I need to interrupt when you're doing such good work and then I want to bring you back together. But here we are. I don't have a bell. I have a moo. Cowbell, that's, that should be my, my solution. All right. So how did you do? Yeah, you've had a, part of me wants to walk through all of these, but part of me knows that you've walked through them and many of you, most of you have had a chance to sort of ask the questions that you need to ask. So if there are any sort of remaining questions, I'd be happy to field those now. Otherwise, we may want to move on to our next activity. Yes. Yeah. The thing is, English is also my second language, and as I discussed earlier, I used to look for the letters in things to speak so that way I could narrow down what words I was looking for. Okay. And when I went through this here, your program, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. your numbers, when it says jump, it has eight letters. Oh, right, right, right. And because they're all made to be the same length instead of, instead of it's not letter, 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 letter. So as a person, you're right. I understand the language, yeah. I will have to have okay. To Sure. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Well, it's it's made as a listening activity. I, I hear your your point. I hear your feedback. It's realistically it's not going to change now. But you would be welcome if that's a strategy that you want to teach and incorporate. You certainly can edit that item, and I could show you how to do that. Oh, yeah, sure. So you can certainly edit that, and then you could make it like line, space, line, space, so that you can show. Um, we didn't build it that way. We made them all the same length because what we're focusing on is the listening, not a predicting skill. But I absolutely hear your feedback. It's, that's another great strategy. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a really good way to think about it. So, yeah, thank you. I, I will show. So what... The comment was, the comment in question was when we see, you know how sometimes when you do a underscore, 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 they're all blended together and it looks like one solid line? But the way it's displaying here, at least, um, that underscore, underscore, underscore is looking like maybe, oh, are there eight letters in this word or something like that, right? So it didn't display as a solid underline as a blank. It looks like maybe I'm looking for a seven, eight letter word. Um, so, so we were talking about, you know, this one is a listening activity. So we actually made that with all of them to have the same length of underline. But if you wanted to, you could certainly, am I in a place where I can edit? Oh, I can't edit right now. Give me a moment. I will get there. As a teacher, and I can, and you would be able to as well, I'm going to get more real estate here. I'm going to go into my questions. I can actually scroll down, and if I wanted to change that, I could certainly go in and edit this question by clicking on the little pencil. This is like the things you would learn to do when you do a Canvas training. But I could click on that question. I could change. See, when I look here, it actually displays as a solid. It displays as a solid line. But if I wanted it, if I wanted to show it as, psst, there's a four letter word. Oh, that sounds terrible, but I'm pretty sure it's a, I'm pretty sure this one's a four-letter word. So I could click and just insert spaces so it would look like, you see what I mean, right? And then I could save, but I'm not going to because that'll mess up the green group <laughs> in what they're doing right now. So I'm going to bail out. Sorry, this is a lot of scrolling. Bloop. OK, so thank you. Duly noted. And you'd be welcome to make that edit. OK, thank you. All right. Any other questions for the good of the order? Are you ready to practice with another module? Yes, ma'am. OK. Okay, yeah. 
great. Let me, um, I will just give as a very general, just for everyone to be able to hear, those are specifics, very helpful specifics. Um, just in general, you do, as an instructor, when you're grading, you will have the option to go and adjust grades as appropriate. If you think, oh no, the student understood that, they listed it as a singular word and it appears plural here, but that's fine, they get it, I wanna give them credit. You can adjust scores. You have a lot of you know, manual, mm, pow power's not the word I want, but you can make those changes if you need to, okay? Um, good, I'm gonna go ahead and have us move on to our next activity um, so that we don't miss the opportunity to do that within this session time. But also, again, happy to answer more specific, um, some of those specific questions as we work through. Wonderful. So um, we're going to move on now to effective presentations, which I think I've referenced earlier as being a really well-received student module. But I'm actually going to pop out here because I want to go into Canvas with all of you. And because we are done with environmental issues for now, I'm going to... Thank you. Look at that. Everybody, close it. Perfect. I'm so glad that I was saying to a table over here that it's just second nature that you're already thinking about that and that you would be remembering to teach your students to do that too. Because at this point, even in this conference, if you had them all open, there is so much scrolling in that navigation. It, it becomes overwhelming. Okay. So we're going to move on to effective presentations. So I'm going to go ahead and open that. I'm going to close my instructor guide for environmental issues. Actually, that one looks like it is too. Okay, so I'm going to go to the Google Drive, and why do I go to the Google Drive? Get my instructional guide, or... Oh, good, thank you, somebody. Handouts, absolutely, yes. So going to have my three tabs open here. Well, two tabs. If you can go ahead and open the effective presentations instructional guide just so we're all on the same page. Can you pop back out to that drive, please, for just a minute, the leaf folder? Yeah, I'm going to pop back out to that drive. Thank you. There, um, sorry. No, that's fine. Um, many of you had questions in, in our last um, exploration about when students are working on the learn activity and could they have a printed copy of the vocabulary. Just a reminder that one of the places where you could get that to just easily provide that and you may want to just do it as a matter of course is in the online components folder here. What appears here is always two versions of the vocabulary list, one with just the word definition and a contextualized sentence, and one that also would include images, two versions. So this would be a place where you could pull that and give that to them so that they have a paper copy to look at as they work through their learn activity for making notes, for spelling help, etc. Yeah, thank you for that reminder. Yes, so you have these two options there. I'm going to go ahead and close those for now. You can take a look at those later. OK. So now you should have, within Canvas, effective presentations open. Within the Google Drive, have your instructional guide open. And I'm now going to peek back in here and ask you to please look at the module delivery notes for this module. <laughs> <laughs> Self-explanatory there. And I want you to identify items that might be key pieces needed for advanced planning. And then just briefly discuss what other items you see in there that you'd want to preview beforehand. So I'll just give you a moment or two to look at that and discuss that at your tables. So what section of your IG are the module delivery notes? 
Oh, I think I heard the answer. Oh, sorry. <laughs> just okay. I was just asking what section of the instructional guide are the module delivery notes? Okay. And I'd Okay, I like it. Yes. They are. They're right after the CCRs, which are the f so it essentially makes it the fourth section. The overview, outcomes, CCRs, and then we get down here. Okay. So what are some of the things that need to happen prior to teaching this? Because there's one thing that's kind of unusual here that I want to make sure everybody saw. The first item. <laughs> what is unique about the first item? They need a handout prior to the first online Canvas session, which means at the end of the week before, whatever is your last class before they're leaving for the weekend, you need to print out and give them this handout. Now that's unusual, that doesn't happen a lot, but when it does, you can see this is bold, it's the first item, they've got a link to it, they're really trying to call, make it easy for you to like, call out. This is, this is something unusual and special, so please be very aware of this. Um, fabulous, okay, and what else do you need to do that will need some prep on the part of the teacher? I see a smile over here. Did, The second item, <laughs> do, do not underestimate the amount of cutting of things you will have to do in this class. Yeah, it's saying on the first day of class, there is an activity in which you need to have cut out things, right? So if you are making your copies as you fly to class, this is gonna be a challenging one to get through. So again, things that really need prepping and planning like that are going to be higher up in this list. And then it kind of starts getting down to sort of like heads up and things you might need to know. And then things about like technology coach, would it be good to have somebody there that day? But we really, again, we just kind of want to highlight and point out the section again and how really imperative it is for your success in the classroom <laughs> um, to, have these, to have these done beforehand when it's called out. Do I see? Thank you. Okay, sorry. Uh, bu -bu 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 -bu. I'm trying to, oh, teach. So down here further, you need to preview what they've done. So having time. If, yes, do their, un will their units allow for that? Um, up here too, just for, for those who might have faculty who aren't as adept at using PowerPoint, they just haven't had a lot of training on it, it's also saying like make sure they review what the students do to know to what level they need to be proficient to be able to explain and support to the students and support what they need to do. They don't have to know everything about PowerPoint, but they need to know the same amount that the students are being asked to do. And so it's saying, you know, go ahead and preview this and make sure that you understand those pieces. So good. So again, just really this activity, just wanting to highlight for you the importance of checking that out. Okay. All right. So we are now, you've had a chance to kind of see how things blend together and we want to give you another opportunity to see how things blend together. So we are looking at the subtopic of introduction to effective presentations. And here, again, this grid you're becoming very familiar with, what they need to do as pre-work online. And who can remind me the amount of time that the pre-work, I guess, is the guideline for completing pre-work? Two hours, right. So they're going to go home and do these two hours. Then they're going to com come to class to practice what they've done. And the class session is written for how long? two hours. There is one exception to this if you are on a five-day week, and that is the Friday class is designed as one hour, at least as far as what's put in the lesson plan. So that gives you some wiggle room if you need some extra time to stretch an activity or go back to something or add in something of your own. But just, yes, absolutely, yeah, thank you. So just to let you know, it is two hours pre-work and two hours of class except for Friday, which is written as a one-hour class. All right, so in looking at this, who can tell me what grammar is called out? 
the imperative, right? So they're going to be at home. They're going to learn about the imperative. And then are they going to practice that when they come to class? What activity is going to practice that? I hear people, yes. <laughs> Great, it's in the title, right? Effective introductions and imperatives. So again, just wanting to show you the blended nature. They're learning it at home. They're coming in and directly applying that. So you have a chance to help them with that application. And when they're meeting challenges and barriers, as opposed to when we introduce something in class and then ask them to go home and practice it, and they're meeting those challenges perhaps without support at home to mitigate it, we're right there. They're also probably getting a chance to see they're not the only one having a challenge with something, right? So there's sort of that safety in like, oh, okay, yeah, we can both ask this. And so I feel like I've, I have noticed um, a marked improvement in students feeling comfortable to ask because we're talking about it. And if people are having a problem producing it or applying it, those questions are coming up right then. And we can help move them past that and, and have success with that point. Oh, you look like you want to add something. Okay. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All right. So we want to give you a chance again to go in and see how those lines are drawn between the two. And so for this one, we're going to ask you to look at the directions for the public speaking activity. And this is in your conference handbook on, I just had that pulled open here. Thank you, 27 and 28. Now we're going to start this in a moment, but this is kind of a a multi-step instruction. So just like when you ask your students, I'm going to put you in partners or pairs. <laughs> Please listen to your number or your letter so you know. <laughs> so for just a moment, I'm going to put you in pairs to complete this activity. But before I do that, I just want to point out in here that, um, well, actually, no, I'm going to put you in your pairs first. I think that will work easier. So I feel, okay, so I'm going to do one, two, so you are A. Okay, you are B, you are A. A, I do B, A, B, A, B's here, and then uh, then A's. Uh, yeah, so we're gonna, I'm gonna say B, and they can jump back in, and you can jump in with one of these. Okay, so then we're actually. So if you are an A, raise your hand. Make sure we've got fairly even numbers. They're all good. Okay, it looks good. B, raise your hand. Did anybody not raise their hand? <laughs> no, okay, wonderful. So when we're looking here at this handout, if you were, if you're an A, you are going to complete the four questions on page 27. So the first four questions. If you are pair B, you are on page 20, sorry, 28. And you also have four questions. So pair A is going to be looking in Canvas at the online work. Pair B is going to be looking at the instructional guide and all of the face-to-face -face work. Please, at this point, do not worry about the other half. Just focus on your half for this activity. So you're going to go to the Infective Presentations Instructional Guide, which I think hopefully we all have open now, and you need to locate the public speaking subtopic. So again, public speaking subtopic, and we'll come around and help you get there if anybody's having a trouble navigating to it. If you were, if, sorry, if you were pair B, you need to be in there. If you're pair A, you're going to be in Canvas, and you're going to find the uh, public speaking subtopic, and you're going to walk through the activities that the students are doing online. So we'll give you guys about 10, 15 minutes uh, to complete your questions. Thank you. And raise your hands if you have any questions or are having problems finding something.
I'm issuing an emergency moo. <laughs> Sorry. For some reason, this handout is unlocked and I can see that some of you are typing in it and I'm going to ask you to please stop typing. I don't know why it's unlocked. It should be view only. It's not your fault, but my emergency moo is so that I can ask you to not type, but you can make a copy if you want to type, but I'm going to lock this one down. Sorry. Moo retracted. Carry on. Okay, so we're going to try and do this. If I can ask all of the A's, so if you were an A, could you please stand up? So only the A's to stand up. <laughs> this is just a visual check for me to make sure. Okay, if you were an A, please find a B partnership to be with. So you should be essentially four people for most groups, right? So we need now for A's and B's to be together, which might be at your table, but you might need to move tables. So I think you guys may want to turn around to that table, uh, perhaps to find the B. So I've got A, B, A, B, A, B here, and it was A, B back there, okay. A's and B's. Did you guys find a match? Excellent. So as we mentioned yesterday, we're really trying to give you a sense of the kind of collaborative activities that are included in the IDEA curriculum. And this is a reading jigsaw. So this is a kind of activity students would also do in class, kind of modified for this. But so now if you could each, we'll give you guys just a little bit of time here to share out and help your friends answer the other half of questions that they did not get a chance to look up. So again, raise your hand if there's any questions. If you didn't get to something, we can help direct you to that information. Thank you. Well, I'm not as clever as Adria with her interrupting cow joke. However, if I can have your attention for just a second, for those of you who have the printed program on page 29, uh, we're actually already kind of in task two as part of this, which is the sharing out with another group to start seeing how those connections are made. But uh, I will direct you to page 29, and we have the questions, task two, 
If you don't have that printed out, we have them up here on the screen. And as you're completing, I think some people are coming to the end of the sharing out, we're going to give you a few more minutes to be looking at these questions and just discussing these in your small groups before we come back together. So I will get these up here for you. Four questions there. So if you could just continue on with your discussion after you've had a chance to share out, and then we'll come back together. Thank you. Okay, so we'll go ahead and come back. We'll go ahead and come back together. <laughs> but a great, a great question came up over here. Um, one of the questions is said, "What, what English or language skills do you see here?" And they were looking specifically for the grammar, and they were saying, "But today I don't see the grammar specifically called out." And it wasn't a part of that because they had done that earlier in the week in another subtopic. That doesn't mean that you're not going to be bringing it up in the class and incorporating it into what you're teaching or the examples or you know eliciting that from the students. But what they do as pre-work is directly tied to what they're doing in class and really relevant. It doesn't sort of ping pong all over the place. Well, last Thursday you did this, and so you know this Wednesday we'll do this. It's always very tied, and that does make it easier. Um, when some of us talk about like attendance challenges, you know, if they're coming to class and they did the pre-work, they're going to be prepared for the activities you have for that day. Um, anyway, so I thank you for that comment, though, of just really seeing how the blending is very intentional between the pre-work of that night and then the face-to-face -face activities for that day. So um, I'm just curious to ask a couple final follow-up questions, and which activities interest you the most in this module, as you've had a chance to kind of look at a few things in two different subtopics? Yeah, in the back, yeah. So, yeah. OK, so the listening and repetition, fabulous, helping with that pronunciation. I think I saw a hand over here. Yeah. Public speaking tips. Yeah, we can all use those, right? <laughs> yeah. I will say, I think that is really fun and gives you a lot of sort of artistic license to be as silly as you want and also to really. Um, model what you know students will typically do that they shouldn't do during it and, and exaggerate it to make it humorous. They love, I think they love just that you're willing to be silly in front of them and sort of give them permission to, I don't know, speak in public. It's not always perfect and uh, I don't know, I feel like that kind of gives them permission to feel more comfortable. That's great, yeah. And then are there any sort of outstanding questions? Because we're coming close to the time for you know, wrapping up this session. But are there any questions that you still have about this module? And actually, I'll just open that up and also say environmental issues at this point. Yeah. Or other burning questions you might have that you want to ask right now outside of those? I was going to say, I'm going to take that as a, nope, we got this. <laughs> we understand how this is working. All right. Well, then I think then we can say uh, thank you so much again for your participation in this discussion. Hopefully, this has also given you another glimpse into the kinds of activities students will be doing, the kind of things you'd be sort of facilitating and instructing in class. And again, that tying, tying in of the blended. Oh, OK, yes. And we'll be back in here at 1. Thank you. Thank you.